Um, so I just want to introduce myself uh, because I know I've met some of you, but I know there are some new forest stewards joining us. So I just want to say hi. Um, my name is Lynn Knapp. I'm with Cascadia Consulting Group, um, and I'm going to be the host for today's webinar. Many of you know my colleague Keegan, who was a previous forest steward uh, workshop coordinator. He is in grad school at UW right now. So I've taken on the reins for these workshops. Um, he's still a forest steward at Woodland Park, so don't worry, you'll still see him around and probably at some of these workshops in the future. Um, so I, I just wanna say thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, I realize that this is a challenging time for everyone and we hope this session can provide some hope and excitement over the work that is still planning to happen in the fall and for Green Seattle Day. So before we get too far here, um, I just want to go over a few features of the Zoom program for those of you who might not be familiar with Zoom or if this is your first Zoom webinar. So the first thing I want to say is that this presentation is being recorded for those who cannot attend and will be sent out to, forest, to all the forest stewards for reference when we're done. Um, Right now, you may have noticed that attendees, all of you, are muted and that your video is off, and this is to minimize interruptions uh, during the presentation portion of the webinar. So we're gonna have 45 minutes for presentation, and then we're gonna do 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the session. Um, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, and then, I will look through those questions and at the end, I will pull some of those out um, and ask our presenters to respond to them, but you can feel free to send them at any time, it won't interrupt the presentation. And then if you have any technical issues during the presentation, you can send a chat directly to me and my colleague Brent, who are the hosts of this meeting using the chat button, also at the bottom of the screen and we can troubleshoot with you. Um, so feel free to send us anything there if you're having um, any troubles. So I want to go over our agenda. Uh, so we're going to start um, with, with me giving some introductions for our awesome plant ecologist presenters. Um, and then we're going to cover the plant order process to ensure that you know how to order plants for your sites. We'll also talk about plant sourcing and how that's considered in light of climate change. Um, discuss how to build your plant order based on your site conditions, and then give a few additional resources. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll go over your questions. So our presenters today are, um, we have Michael, who manages the professional crews that work in Seattle parks. Um, and he also focuses on climate change effects on our parks and madrone recovery, important. Um, and then we have Eric, who I think a lot of you know. <laughs> um, he helps the forest stewards. Uh, it supports them to make sure everything is in place for work parties, like tools, mulch, plant orders, like we'll talk about today. And then we have Lisa, um, who manages GSP's multitude of partner organizations and works hands-on in parks to provide general support for the program. Um, she also uh, does eco-monitoring for our diverse urban forests. So, uh, welcome to all of them. Thanks for taking the time to present with us today. Um, so now I'm going to pass control over to Eric to start us off on the plant order uh, process here. Okay, Eric, there you go. Okay, all right. Now we're going to go over the plant ordering process. All right, for the 2020 plant order, um, you all should have received an email from me. And if you haven't, please, first off, um, I apologize and reach out to me if you haven't received an email from me. Um, the order is always based on availability from the nurseries. And that's why, unfortunately, I know a lot of folks don't like that I request it so early, but this really gives us um, a jump on reaching out to those nurseries. Um, I work within the constraints of city purchasing restrictions. So that also limits my ability to source some material, I pardon, um, you know, there is things that I took off the list this year, and a lot of that had to do with cost, um, cost challenges, and also my restrictions that I face. Um, every year there's unforeseen disease and crop failures, so I may let you know that 
um, I received, you know, I got your order and I'm, I, it's all good. And then all of a sudden I'll get a, I'll get contacted by the growers that they had a, a mass failure of production. Um, some of you know that we do grow plant material um, at the Jefferson Horticulture Facility. Johan is our senior gardener that maintains and grows annually just under 10,000 plants for us each year. Um, most of the material is one gallon and some of it is four inch material. Um, I'm going to just say right now that we're moving to more four inch material for cost savings and also for constant storage challenges. You can see in the photo, this is where our temporary nursery is. Some of you may have been there before. Um, and unfortunately, yes, we are gonna be probably facing some potential COVID impacts and the West Seattle Bridge being closed, that temporary nursery is on the Duwamish River. Sam, get the slide to go. Due date is May fifth, uh, May fifteenth, um, and that is in my email. All right, so you should have received an email from me with detailed instructions. Um, Survey Monkey is where this happens and where you place your order. You will receive a confirmation from me by email that I received your and processed your order from Survey Monkey. Then I will be in touch in September um, to confirm the, the plants and the quantities that I was able to get from the nursery. Plants are uh, supposed to always be delivered in uh, October to November. Um, obviously, Green Seattle Day sites are the priority, and I do prioritize folks that have events posted as best within my abilities and with crew resources. And then um, you, uh, all the amazing forest stewards and um, your volunteers get to plant the plants. Um, and ideally those are planted as soon as possible. Um, we wanna get those plants in the ground um, and not, not delay. Um, and then hopefully everything is in the ground before March. All right, so here's just a, a snippet of what that looks like. A lot of you are familiar with it. Um, if anybody has any questions, please reach out to me. And this year, um, we're asking that each forest steward only order 250 plants. And this is, um, um, per, this is for us managing what um, for some implications are gonna be from COVID response. Um, and as always, I always want folks to order in, uh, in, in groups of 10, so five, 10, 20. I do always get the question, can I order smaller amounts of things if I have a real small site? Um, I say that is, that is a consideration I can make, but it makes it easier for the crews if we order in five, 10, and 20, et cetera. And please, please make sure to check your math and uh, let me know what park you're gonna be active in. And you must be up to date with your Cedar work logs. Um, I'd like to highlight some other plant sources. Um, we talk a lot about at your site visits, how you can harvest live stakes from your site. Um, there is the live stake beds at Magnuson that is managed by the Washington Native Plant Society. So please reach out to me if that is something that's interested to you in the fall. Um, you always can collect seeds from your site. I've been talking about this a lot at site visits. Um, so please reach out to myself and Maya if you have questions about seed collection on your site. And then obviously every year I reach out to those that are interested for the bare root plant sale. And hopefully we'll be able to do that again in the spring of 2021. And also you can go to our website and search Green Seattle uh, Plant Propagation. All right. Hi. All right, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, it's always good to talk about climate change when it's nice and toasty outside. Otherwise, it's, um, yeah, it doesn't seem real. But as you, uh, as you all might know, climate change is here. The Seattle area keeps getting warmer. Um, right here, just to preface this whole conversation, I just want to um, direct your attention to this thermal imagery we have from a couple of years ago. You can see this one date. It doesn't, uh, I don't necessarily know what those temperatures, what those colors reflect as in exact temperature, but just know it's all sort of relative. So you can see where the warmest, where the war warmest areas are in the city. And those generally reflect the areas that do not have canopy cover at all. 
And so these days, on, on this one day on 2014, this other day in the fall of 2016, you see how the temperatures have changed. Like one day, that day in 2014 was a high of 84 degrees. And then over here on this 2016, the, the high of that day was 66 degrees. You can see some kind of mediating effect that the water has on, on land temperatures. So if you happen to be in one of those parks that's closer to water or streams, there will probably be less of a warming, generally less of a warming effect in those parks. So, you know, this is just, uh, so generally though, there's warming some summers, like by mid-century, I've seen projections that show as high as like, those summers will be nine degrees warmer than normal than we have received traditionally. So even though if you come from a different area and you're, you're here in Seattle and the summers seem kind of temperate to you, uh, just know that our local plant populations have really been adapted to historical trends of climate. So this general warming has some effect on local populations. And so plants have always responded to climate and the way they do that is to die or they move. However, with the city, the across the urban landscape, how fragmented it is, all our parks are fragmented. So those local populations no longer really mix together anymore. So the principal reason why we replant is to import plant material. And we've been cr basically conducting a grand genetic experiment for at least 15 years now. So what we know is that um, since our plants can't move and so we are intentionally bringing plant material in and placing it in parks um, is that you know, our temperature is, is warming so there have been some projections showing that by mid-century actually late century that our climate will be very similar to that further south of us. So like in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, it's about 250 miles or so south of us. Um, it's, uh, it's generally a little bit warmer. So by mid-century, we will, we will be basically living in that sort of Willamette Val Valley temperatures. And so that is the next ecoregion directly to the south of us. And so that's where we are actually looking to source plant material from that's somewhat pre-adapted to the future climate. So I think all of you might have, will still be under the assumption that all plant material comes from Seattle. Um, Eric mentioned that we have a vendor agreements with nurseries nearby. So plant material is grown at Jefferson Greenhouse. That plant material, however, comes from all different areas. It could come from Seattle, more than likely not. More than likely it comes from surrounding areas. So um, what we have been doing, like in the past, like maybe two decades ago or something, we may, in the greenhouse, we may have grown and propagated plant material directly from Seattle because we thought local was best and it was adapted and appropriate for replanting in Seattle's urban areas. But now our program, we plant like between 75,000 and 100,000 plants a year. So given our desire for plant material and our need for it, we source material further out. So it comes from north, it comes from the north, it comes from Vashon Island, it comes from the it comes from Enumclaw. So that plant material is mixed. And so what we really have have is this kind of relaxed provenancing strategy. So provenance really refers to the ultimate origin of the plant material. So for example, seed is collected from somewhere out in Enumclaw and then it's grown from seed. So the provenance of that area is from somewhere other than Seattle. And then it could be grown in Enumclaw, it could be grown in Seattle, but ultimately we can't, we have some flexibility to pull plant material, like plant seed sources and plant material from other locations. So what we call this is a sort of composite provenancing strategy, which uh, unintentionally or unintentionally we have been doing for years now. 
Oh, I'm gonna go back one. So what and the research that we've been doing, we're actually kind of behind the scenes. We've been thinking about this for a couple of years now. And we have a stewardship report with the vulnerability assessments, which really gave us some recommendations to start looking at longer lived climate adjusted species. So at this point in time, we are not thinking about moving different species from their current range north into Seattle because we are properly within the basically the middle of the range of all of our conifer species that we commonly use. So what we're looking at is just sourcing different genotypes from the Willamette Valley up into Seattle. So, um, and what this reflects is on the, on the back end, we're doing the work to source that material from a different place. So really the take home messages from this is that you don't need to make these decisions However, some trees in your plant order may come from Oregon. So we are focusing on those longer lived conifer species and really no other species at this time. But can, we will probably continue to see our local species ex become more, become more, or apparently become more sensitive or exposed to different temperature and precipitation regimes. And, um, some local species will become will adapt, but we are actively looking at this um, kind of a solutions based approach to help our forests adapt to future climates and we're looking further south. So you can feel free, this is the end of my talk right now, but you can feel free to reach out to us and we'd like to continue this conversation because it's not just an ecological question, but there's a lot of um, kind of social questions involved in it as well. And there'll be much more on climate change in the fall workshop. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? I guess you can't respond. Um, again, my name is Lisa and I'm happy to be here with Michael and Eric today. Thank you guys for those uh, background on the plant sourcing piece. Um, my responsibility today is to talk a little bit about the uh, how to build out your plant order. So I'm going to do that in, see if I can get this to work, um, in eight easy steps. So um, we're going to start with some, some of the basics of how to look at your site and get, get to the point um, by the end of this presentation where we'll be talking about kind of what plants um, you can select and use in your, in your plant order. And to do that today, I want to use an example site. Um, this is Sacagawea Playground in Lake City um, and is a, a restoration site that's managed by Earth Corps. They lead volunteer events there throughout the year. Here's an image of the, the site itself. So to get us started, um, everybody close your eyes. You too, Eric. There you go. So bring yourself to your restoration site, um, or better yet, after this webinar, uh, take yourself um, for a little walk, hopefully in your neighborhood, to your restoration site to start really considering the ecological conditions um, and getting just kind of having a, a chance to step back and consider um, what's going on at your site. And to start, I want to look at kind of the, the broader picture, so the what's the slope and aspect what are the canopy conditions? Um, if you're looking up, are you seeing gaps? Um, are you seeing a lot of sunshine uh, on the forest floor? Are you, is it really dark? Those are all gonna be important questions um, as you're building out your planting plan. Uh, the second piece would be to consider what species are present. So what are the dominant species? Are you seeing a ton of sword fern or um, a lot of, um, uh, big leaf maple, regenerating big leaf maple. Um, and then what are the species that you don't recognize at all? This is maybe a great chance uh, in life to sit down at home with your plant ID books and spend a little bit more time um, going through those unknown species um, and doing that ID work. Uh, because again, that's a really important signal for what's gonna be appropriate at your site. And then the, the third piece of the species um, assessment is to really consider what your what the history of invasive species is at your site. Um, are you do you have species that are likely to be coming back and, and um, being a problem again in the coming years? Um, 
And then the third part is to sit down on the ground like Bridget and Eric here and um, put your hands down into the dirt um, and really spend some time thinking about what, uh, what the soil type is, what that soil moisture is like. Um, is it wet? Is it super compacted? Um, you have a hard time getting a shovel in there. Um, is there wood laying down on the ground that's going to be kind of your future organic matter um, in the soil? Uh, are there signs of erosion? Like is there water coming through this site off the road? Um, are there areas of bare ground that indicate another level of, um, of disturbance on your site? All of those are going to be kind of pretty critical um, questions that you need to sit down and hang out with um, in order to build your plant plan, a uh, plant list. So using our example site again, this is um, second we have played around um, with the natural area um, on kind of both sides of the park. Um, and just to give you some background, so this is mostly uh, west facing, uh, a little bit south facing, um, and it has a pretty variable slope. Um, there's sunshine there. Uh, and so we have some canopy gaps. Uh, there's mature Oregon grape and sword fern populations around some of the, the larger trees. Um, and so that's a good signal for what might be appropriate. Um, there's also this population of Archangel, yellow Archangel up at the top close to that house that's coming out of their yard. That's gonna be something that we need to think about in our planting area and plan. Um, there's compost piles. so. Uh, a clear signal of restoration um, underway um, and particularly a lot of ivy um, that um, that is probably uh, pretty well controlled like I wouldn't be too worried about that in the planting plan um, but it might also mean that uh, there's going to be species that were under that ivy that are now going to kind of come out and show their faces. Uh, there's also large down wood. So again, kind of thinking about like, ooh, maybe this is going to be my chance to have something that really needs that woody debris in order to, to do well. Uh, there's also an old home site, maybe some, some evidence of a, um, of a foundation. And so what I plant there is going to be really different. And then this mulch mountain that you can see all the way on the, the right side indicates that we've done, that there's, there's some work around soil improvement that's already underway at the site. Uh, and then the last thing, I don't know if you saw that add-in, but as you go um, left in the picture, uh, downslope, the site gets progressively really wet to the point where there's designated wetland at the other end of the park. And so knowing that there's the, there's, uh, that kind of moisture gradient is really important in the planting plan. So on a side note, I just wanted to throw out that, you know, ecological assessment um, can be super overwhelming for some people. It's like, I'm not an ecologist. What are you guys talking about? Um, but again, bringing it back to observation, and one way to do that is through photos. Um, this is a series of photos um, from a photo monitoring point, so a single point where they went back. And this allows, um, this is a nice way to look at kind of change over time. Um, but it, but detailed photos of what's coming up when um, might be a really nice way to kind of catalog um, some of this same information at your site. So our second step is to consider the trail corridor. Um, in Seattle Parks, we have over 100 um, miles of uh, formal trail um, and then we have probably that and then more of stewardship paths and social trails. Um, so the formal trails have a standard trail tread. Um, for the most part, uh, there's just a handful of parks where it's not this, but for the most part, it's four feet wide. Um, so in this image, you can see the trail tread is mostly covered with leaves. If we peeled that back, we would be able to clearly see that that corridor is, um, or that trail tread uh, the gravel surface is four feet wide. Um, and then the trail corridor is three feet on each side of that, that four foot. So, um, and then eight feet tall as well. And that's really going to have a huge impact on what you're selecting to plant and what you can't plant. We definitely have a history of uh, GSP sites that are now growing up with conifers. Um, imagine all these sword ferns that are in this image replaced with conifers. It doesn't doesn't um, bode well for those conifers because there's gonna over time need to be maintenance either in pruning or removal um, to, to make it so that that trail 
uh, corridor is still usable. Um, for stewardship paths and social trails, those are not um, official trails. Um, we definitely encourage that they're closed over time, but you have to ask yourself kind of, are they ready to be closed? Are you still running large events? Um, or or um, are, is it feasible to close them? Some social trails, even if they're not part of our formal system, are so well ingrained that it's hard to close them. Um, either way, always considering uh, limiting access is an important thing and whether or not your plant material that you that you put in the ground is a way to do that or if it's you know dragging that IV pile into the uh, into the trail that might be another option but definitely considering the trail corridors. So in our example here we're returning to the um, Green Seattle Partnership reference map and um, selecting the layer called Seattle Trails um, right here in the red box and uh, you can see um, we recently updated it so that you can see the formal trails as well as the restoration trails. That's selected and it suggests that at Sacagawea there's no formal trail system. It's, you know, always a data thing, right? Like there's always a chance that what's there um, is not perfectly accurate. There's a, there's efforts right now underway to continue to improve that data set. Um, but so again, at our example site, um, we immediately see that there's actually a paved trail um, in that, that red box there. Um, and so that's a, uh, something to note about the formal trails is it's really the soft surface trails, not the paved trails that are on that, that layer. Um, another option is that you could look at Google Maps. Oftentimes, um, the way that they open source data, there's some of the, the trails, they won't be marked as formal or not, but it's one way of looking for that information or you could just go to your site and look for it as well. Um, but if you were trying to look to kind of get it mapped out, that's one way of doing it. Step three is to consider the utility corridors. So both the overhead utilities um, and the underground utilities. Uh, in this picture, uh, you see a conifer that's been limbed up. It's not the best picture, but it's what I could find. Um, and is a, a mess of a tree now that it's been trying to grow up next to that those utility lines. And so even though we're putting in teeny tiny conifers, we're trying to end up with this size tree. We really need to be careful about where we're putting them so that we can actually grow them into the future. Um, nobody wants an ugly tree like this. Uh, so the, there's clearance information provided here um, as well as in the forest steward field guide if you need that quick reference again. Um, for underground utilities, um, I would point you to the Green Seattle Partnership reference map uh, that again includes a layer uh, of sewage and drainage lines. Um, this is by no means a complete layer of everything that could be underground. There's, um, you know, uh, stuff that probably is not mapped, um, but it's a starting point for kind of understanding, especially SPU utilities, Seattle Public Utility. Um, infrastructure that's in place in parks. Uh, there's a lot of undeveloped right-of-ways that are actually uh, internal to Seattle Park property and so um, there's plenty of spaces where we have pipes coming through the middle of parks and what you would consider natural areas. In this case, not planting on top of those areas and providing a buffer, uh, not planting large trees on top of those areas and providing a buffer is important and then also just anticipating that there's going to be some eventual um, access needs in those um, in, in those areas in your planting time. So just in this picture, um, there's a light pole, so it's a little bit different, still utility, and we're gonna try and avoid putting anything that's gonna block that light over time. So the next consideration, um, step four, is to think about the edges, the entrances, and the social use, and in this, in this piece, it's almost like doing a social assessment um, in addition to your ecological assessment, going to your site, sitting there, hanging out, how, how and watching how people um, interact with the space um, or kind of making notes. Um, I think that uh, there's been a number of times where Eric and Michael and I have been someplace and been like, oh my gosh, what's happening here? There must be this like nightly ritual, something people are hanging out here all the time and then it turns out that it's actually um, the, the preschool from down the street that's there and, and making huge impacts in a space. And so trying to kind of understand 
how people use the space, um, knowing that we all, we come to parks in very different ways. Some people have a lot of fear around um, natural areas. Um, and so considering the edges and how we welcome people in and what that use might look like for somebody, not yourself, um, is a really uh, critical part to building out your planting plan. Um, this document, the best management practices for crime prevention through environmental design in natural landscapes developed with um, Forterra and the Green City Partnerships um, is awesome way to uh, learn a lot more about um, SEPTED, which is a principle in landscape management and um, and offers a lot of information, not only about kind of like how people perceive spaces, but how to how to take that to your restoration site and do consider plant selection as well as um, potentially some maintenance and areas that have already been overplanted. Um, so important consideration for this particular example, I just wanted to call out that this paved path um, takes you through the park and to the elementary school that's on the north end of the park. And so just that safe routes to school aspect, making sure that people can feel safe um, uh, entering and accessing the park from here is um, important. So step five is figuring out your restoration target. Um, knowing what your end goal is, or at least having a, a concept around that uh, is a really critical part of the international standards uh, for restoration and um, something that we have developed with the Green Seattle Partnership is utilizing both target systems and target forest types. This is probably information that folks on the call are familiar with um, as it's introduced in, um, in a lot of the different forest steward workshops. Um, target systems are the broader classification um, that kind of categorizes the plant community, whereas the target forest types are the plant associations. Um, so that, that occur within uh, certain target systems. Um, and our goal in using these, um, these two uh, systems is to um, promote biodiversity, make sure that we're seeing um, opportunities for managing for rare plants and, and less common uh, plant communities within the city um, to definitely guide appropriate plant selection. Um, and then also, like I was saying, it's an important part of restoration ecology and that we really need to be able to have something that we're measuring progress against. Um, in Seattle, uh, the way that we look at this, this is Michael modeling, it's very nice. Nice job, Michael. Um, oh yeah, see, ooh, it works from home. Uh, we're talking about native canopy cover, evergreen, lots of baby trees, um, high diversity of those species, a low herbaceous weeds and uh, woody invasive weed cover, and then high native cover, high understory cover and, and lots of diversity there. So again, it might feel like a complicated um, concept, but the, the if you kind of simplify it um, up a little bit or back up and simplify a little bit and just look at um, trying to build out these key characteristics, this form means that we'll get the function out of the forage that we're looking for. Reference ecosystem information lives on the Green Seattle Partnership website. Again, Googling GSP reference ecosystems will get you there. Um, you can also use the search function within uh, the greenseattle.org uh, website and it'll get you there. So within each of these um, the description for each of the systems and target force types is included here. And in order to figure out your um, your targets for your particular site, uh, you can go back to the Green Seattle Partnership reference map. This is like an ad for the reference map. I love it. Um, and you can um, click on the, the polygon, the red boundary around your zone at your site, and it has information um, in two pages, it says one of two at the top left of that box, um, but there's also a scroll bar there. So it'll show us the target forest type um, there. This one is, um, in its short name, is Acma Pismi Coco Haiti. 
uh, or otherwise known as big leaf maple, Douglas fir, um, big hazelnut, and water leaf, Pacific water leaf. That was like a good quiz because I didn't practice that before. Sometimes that translation doesn't work in my head. And I'm like, cocoa, cornest, uh, yeah, cocoa. So then the second piece is the target ecosystems. The, um, and this particular one is riparian forest and shrubland, which is a little surprising to me, uh, but I think it's associated with the fact that as you go farther north, it gets really wet. So as a side note, the target systems are, we have over uh, 1500 zones within the Green Seattle Partnership Network. Uh, they're not always perfect um, in part because the, um, because the zones themselves are not, weren't developed to just, to, to just identify those targets. And so there might be cases where it's more appropriate for one end of the zone and not the other uh, where you're working. But um, as you scroll down again, um, you, for the most part on the map, it should work. Um, there's a link there that'll take you to that same detailed information that's on the Green Seattle website. So our sixth step is to measure our area or areas. Um, and again, I'm using the Green Seattle Partnership reference map. Um, there's a measuring tool, get to square footage. So we have one area that's um, more maintenance um, and a second area that's never seen uh, planting before. And so that area um, measured there is what I'm gonna focus on for, for our explanation today. Um, step seven is select plant quantities and step eight is identify which species you want to use. You could do those in reverse order if you want, um, but I like to start with kind of understanding what, what I want, how, how many trees, shrubs, or uh, ground cover I'd like to see in my site. Uh, this is an image from the um, Forest Steward Field Guide, the new version. You guys don't even know about that yet. It's about to come out, about to drop here in the next... I don't know, whenever we can get it printed at a printing shop. Um, so I also like working in, in Excel um, so that it can do the work, the math for me, but you, you know, whatever format um, makes sense for you. So I'm taking my uh, square footage and using that same table to do the math to come up with the recommended quantities. So those are the recommended quantities, but I am not going to order or be able to order uh, 1,400, I saw that face, Michael, 1,400 um, ground cover for this particular site. It's a um, pretty um, high density. Um, and so our um, final, my final quantities or my goals is kind of an adjusted version of that. And usually when Michael, Eric, or I are doing um, planting plans, we're looking for more like 2,000 plants per acre, and that's considering, that's in sites where we have not, um, or where there's existing cover and existing species, and that's generally what we're planting into. If we were going to do a site uh, where we were scraping down the soil and there was no, no chance of anything, that um, we might be looking for higher density, but in this case, that's kind of our target. On a side note, I just wanted to mention that Clump gap mosaic is a fancy way of saying that we're going, going to, um, all these plants are not going to be evenly distributed across the site, that we're, we're really advocating for you to clump um, plants from, um, or a number of plants from the same species together across the, um, ac across your planting area, um, and then to fill in kind of the in-betweens with this uh, smaller clumps or a single plants. That's described again in more detail in the Forest Steward Field Guide, um, but helps kind of, might help you get a little better picture of how to do that layout. Um, and in ordering, it might feel like, oh my god, why am I going to get, um, how am I ever going to fit, you know, 30 sword fern in a single site? Well, if you're doing kind of this density of um, clumping, uh, it might make more sense that way. Um, and then the last step is the species selection. And um, I'm not gonna run through exactly what I selected here in a lot of detail, but just to point out um, that, I, that I have my quantities that I was aiming for in trees, shrubs, and ground cover. Um, I will mention a couple of the species that I selected. Goat's beard, one of my favorites, um, can handle, yeah. There we go, Eric likes it too. It gets Eric's approval, what about Michael? <laughs> 
Um, it is, uh, it dies back to the ground every year, and so it's not gonna provide that winter cover, um, but it's an awesome um, flowering um, and relatively large three to five feet tall um, herbaceous plant for your site. Um, Oregon grape, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, is present at the site and it's gonna do really awesome in some of the higher upland portions of the site. Cascara, another one, if you haven't ordered it yet, this is the year, it's one of my favorites. Um, pollinators love it. Uh, and it provide, it's a you know, mid-story mid tree uh, that can provide um, some nice diversity. We're talking about climate change. You know, one of our strategies is to talk about um, building in diversity at the site. And that's a similar um, uh, consideration here. Grand fir, um, although not a really strong part of the target for this particular zone, um, isn't it, bringing this in where there has already been planting of other conifer species might offer um, the right the right species to fill future climate conditions. Uh, Vancouveria or inside out flowers, another um, fun, small herbaceous plant that um, will, will help me in those areas where I wanted to limit, um, limit tall plants right on the edges. Sword fern, a workhorse of our restoration sites. Um, it's gonna provide a lot of the, the evergreen cover there. Um, as will um, snowberry, and again, this is a nice one to be able to include in um, maybe in that old home site or where there's more compacted soils um, and can kind of handle everything. And then kind of the last one to mention would just be evergreen huckleberry. Um, uh, this is another nice opportunity to include um, a evergreen uh, mid-sized shrub um, that that offers a lot of pollinator opportunities as well. So that is the quick gist of the, the plant list development. Eric's gonna share um, some additional resources. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. All right, so additional resources. Um, I know we mentioned the website already. Um, I hope all of you are spending time on there already and can reach out to me for uh, any interest, any questions. Um, the new field guide, we have been, um, this has been a work in progress and uh, we're really excited about the new field guide. Um, we also frequently update the website, which I just referenced and you can go there and you can, um, there's a link at the bottom. This presentation is being recorded so you can always reference back to this presentation for anything that Lisa talked about. Um, I'm here for you, Maya is here for you. Um, we hopefully are providing you with lots and lots of resources. And I'm really excited about the new field guide. So thank you for everyone on the team that has worked on this. I know there's lots of staff that have helped on that. Um, the Washington Native Plant Society, um, the plant directory, super helpful. I um, use this very often. Um, I constantly am like, hey, what was the name of that plant again? Um, there's lots and lots of great resources and it's um, Native Plant Appreciation Month. So please um, also, they have a lot of great stuff in the Washington Native Plants Society. Um, sound, you can search for Sound Native Plants. Um, this is another great resource. Um, there's their website there. Um, you can reach out to me if you have questions about how to look up Sound Native Plants. Um, our friends with King County, um, also super helpful. There's a great diagram right there on the um, slide that uh, kind of relates to what Lisa was talking about. Um, and uh, this particular one is dry, dry um, part shade. Um, I, I often am using King County as well for reference for material. Um, there is the Steward Annual Plan Workbook. This is on our website. Um, so this is something that we could work with you on if you're interested. Um, it's a, a valuable document uh, that Maya and I can easily help you um, move this forward. There's also um, the stewardship planning guide. Um, this is uh, a little bit more in depth um, and again something that's on our website and something we could help you with if you're interested in, in diving deeper into your um, planning for your site. And that is the end of the PowerPoint, and we left some time for questions. Yeah, so um, 
I will go ahead and um, remind people that to submit questions, you can click that Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, I also just wanted to pause here um, and uh, we got a reminder from one of the participants, thank you, Heather, about doing um, a land acknowledgement during this time. And I, I want to say that I totally forgot to do that at the beginning uh, because usually um, we're all together in these spaces uh, during the workshop and uh, most of us are at home and still on this land. So um, as we go into planting season, just want to acknowledge the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples, um, past and present, and honor um, with gratitude the land that we will work on in this uh, planting work. So um, that being said, I'm going to uh, look at some of the questions here. We'll try to get as many of these answered as we can. Um, first question is for Eric. Uh, can we be notified the day of delivery and as being delivered to assist and move from the drop zone and minimize potential theft? Yeah, so um, we do our best to be in contact with uh, folks. So um, the directions for the crews is to contact the forest steward um, for day of delivery. If somebody has specific requirements or unique scenarios, um, they can reach out to me once we get closer to the delivery time and I can um, try do my best to do an advanced um, coordination. But they do call on the day of delivery and um, they would definitely appreciate some help does that, does that answer the question? I'm gonna say yes. Great. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's great. Um, Lisa, I think this one's for you. Um, could you please review the trail corridor buffer requirements along a paved trail? Compare, compare the paved trail in the photo of the Sacagawea playground and the 10 foot asphalt trail, for example, of the Burke Gilman Trail. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, I don't immediately know if there is a standard for the Burke Gilman, and so I could point to Eric or Michael, either of you, yes or no. I will say that I think the main consideration or difference maybe in uh, the Burke Gilman Trail is that because it's used for biking and running and walking, um, uh, considering visibility is a really critical part and there's people that are coming on and off the trail at different points um, considering visibility is a really important part of planting plans um, we've definitely been called back to the Burt Gilman to remove plants where or, where or do pretty heavy pruning um, where it's impacting bike safety um, so that would be one thing I'd offer and then um, Eric if you know of any differences in that tree setback or ground cover setback, I kind of think it's probably similar, 10 feet back yeah. from the trail edge for trees um, yeah. and shrubs um, <clears throat> outside of that three foot. Yeah, and I think also just, um, I think, Lisa, I think you're correct on that. Um, I haven't necessarily seen anything, but it's such a highly used trail um, and really thinking about the spur connection points um, really being mindful of shrub and tree location versus lower growing herbaceous plant material. Great. Thank you. Um, another question um, that I think any of you could provide some input on. Um, I noted a point under the subject of restoration target and biodiversity of promoting rare plants and communities. That seems to be a newer idea and one that expands beyond Pacific Northwest natives. Is there an attempt to add dry, more dry loving plants or something else? So Michael, maybe you want to start on that one? Sure. So I think the, I think what's compelling right now is that, you know, largely a lot of our forests are like, what we're shooting for is these bigger Douglas fir slash Western hemlock type forests. So I think what we discourage is if we have like an oak forest or if we have a like a predominantly like a madrone forest is that we're not planting it like your typical big like western red cedar slash Douglas fir slash western hemlock forest. So taking the opportunity that we're not because we're trying to promote diversity particularly in those underrepresented forest systems that we're not kind of creating this monoculture ever. So kind of working within 
kind of working with the ecosystem that you already have and assisting the trajectory that it would have, it would kind of be on um, normally. So, um, so, and then also as well, like if we do have, I don't think we, there's a few places where we do have like rare plants and um, really that we won't find anywhere else. So I think we want to take the opportunity to, um, especially those little herbaceous and kind of fluffy plants, like take the opportunity to kind of promote those and protect those. Great. So um, I think you kind of address this a little bit, but we just got the question of like, what is a rare plant? Like what constitutes a rare plant? Um, would you say that's just being in sort of one park, one area of the city? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, so rare plants, I mean, there are a few, um, Eric, uh, or there's like some orchids, mm -hmm. like in Lincoln Park, yeah. which you don't find anywhere else, and they're on a like a list that is, um, is kind of stewarded by the state, and so there are those rare plants, um, they're very, yeah, they're not a lot, I mean, really, we live in this very urban system that's been degraded, damaged, or destroyed, you know, somewhat over the past couple hundred years. So there aren't a ton of, like we said, rare plants, but we just want to say maybe say uncommon plants. Yeah. And I think Eric, or, you know, the past years when um, other people were taking on the, the plant acquisition, now Eric has done a good job too of trying to preserve some diversity so those little like herbaceous or yep. plants or forbs really there are some opportunities to to add those in uh it may not happen it may not be super appropriate at the very beginning when you're working on a very fresh site um that's you know recently been covered in ivy for decades but in the latter phases of restoration perhaps you can start to slip them in and if you do have like really like nice dank soils, like maybe you can get the wild ginger going or the uh, the inside out flower, which yeah. I have, yeah, in my front yard or the, the myanthemum or whatever going. So I just add to that, Michael, I have done, I think, a, a good job of trying to get more and more diversity on our availability list. I will point out that the list is just a little shortened this year. That is for um, reduction, anticipation reduction in my budget for plant material and also um, um, it's also really hard for me sometimes to source some of those more um, harder to find species. Um, I did offer some things last year that we hadn't in previous years. I am open to feedback um, and welcome feedback. Um, but I will point out though the current list that is on SurveyMonkey that I sent in three different attachments. So there's an Adobe form, there's a Word document, and there's an Excel spreadsheet. They're all the same lists of plants. That's like a wish list for Christmas for forest stewards. Christmas comes early in the fall, but I can't always go out and shop and find all of them. I, I, that's the only way I can really do it. And I can't tell the nurseries in advance to grow certain things. So um, I do work with Johan um, on trying to um, grow like inside out flower. That is something I haven't necessarily offered. And it's, it's often something hard to find. Um, I'm hoping to in the future have a, a larger pool of nurseries that I can buy from. So. Great. And just to clarify, um, when we're talking about these rare plants, um, that still means a Pacific Northwest native plant. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, really. A, yeah. So a Pacific Northwest plant. And yeah, I think when we reach too far, I can imagine there's some, uh, let's say some grasses that we might want to grow, like a nacella or something that's really beautiful bunch grass that's really traditionally found in California. And so we are sort of outside its range. I think there's probably another surrogate um, grass or gramonid that's more appropriate that we can easily find um, for in Pacific Northwest native nurseries here. Great. Um, and we're just almost at time here. So I want to ask one more question um, and then we'll wrap up. So um, maybe Lisa <laughs> to start on this one. Um, so in light of an uptick in coronavirus infections in the fall, what contingency plans are being considered if we cannot hold large community gatherings or have a limited number of people in an area at that time? 
will there be any way to store plants for extended periods? Um, and then also will parks set protocol for events under those conditions? Um, and I'll preface your response by saying it's an ever-changing situation, but... Yeah, exactly what I was going to say. I feel like every week, um, Michael, Eric, uh, Patty, and I meet by phone every morning um, for a half an hour, and it's a, it's a changing situation, right? Um, we, we really have not landed on a new normal yet, um, and we are in the process of really trying to make some plan so that we can move forward work appropriately um, and trying to understand, you know, how much work has been lost over the course of the last couple um, months or can we foresee losing is it's on our minds and we're working on it. Um, for fall, um, I think we are, we're definitely considering um, how, how that's going to impact this plant order and that's part of feeling okay about reducing the total numbers is that um, I think it'll it means that we're not going to have too many plants sitting at people's sites if in fact we have to continue to limit volunteer events um, or the size of those particular events um, and and so in that way I would definitely encourage people to still be conservative if you feel like um, 250 plants is too much for you um, to to look at planting um, in smaller events or alone over the course of next winter, um, be conservative because I think it, there is a strong chance that we'll be limiting larger events. But we don't have that direction yet. We really, we have no idea. Um, not something we've ever done before, it turns out. Um, and, you know, as things proceed and as we restart volunteer events, there's definitely going to be some protocols for how those events go down and, um, and how we move them forward. Uh, We've been getting a lot of practice with uh, having crews out in the field, still continuing to uh, manage noxious weeds, um, again, starting this week and, and doing some of plant establishment work. Um, and so we, yeah, we're, we're hopefully we'll have a clear picture of how to um, get volunteer events up and running safely um, when we're allowed to do that. Great. Thank you. Um, so I know there are a few questions we didn't get to. So um, I'll propose that we, uh, when we send out this video, we can uh, include responses to these questions uh, when, we, when we send that out. So um, for now, I just wanna say thank you to everyone um, for engaging with us today. Thank you, Lisa, Eric, and Michael um, for providing the background and procedures to ensure that everyone has a successful fall planting and we'll hope that it can move forward as it has in the past. Um, if any of the foresters have further questions, as Eric mentioned, you can reach out to him or Maya. Um, but with that, thank you all. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Lynn. Thanks, Lisa. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.